Welcome to Fizz. <laughs> That's fun, interactive Sunday school. And uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your uh, participation. And uh, pray that soon we'll be able to meet in person in Sunday school. But uh, until such time as it's totally safe, I think uh, this is a good way to, to took a, take a look at a Sunday school lesson. By the way, if you're interested in doing a Sunday school lesson by Zoom, uh, or FaceTime or one of those uh, that has multiple people capability. I'm not sure all the ones that do. I have Zoom and if you can unload Zoom and you want to actually participate online uh, we can do that and uh, just drop me a note at the uh, information that you'll see on this video uh, my email address and let me know that you'd like to do a Zoom Sunday School lesson and we can discuss uh, what's on the video. We can actually start over again in the, on the uh, Zoom uh, video. But in any case, uh, let, let me, because we're coming to a close on the, the Book of Romans, uh, let me just kind of review where we've been. Uh, we had 13 lessons so far. And the first one was on compelled. And it uh, means that because we're believers and because we love Christ and Christ loves us, we're compelled uh, to respond to his, to a loving God and uh, was a great lesson. Then we had guilty uh, and that pointed out clearly that we're all guilty. Um, we all sin and therefore we're all guilty of sin and the wages of sin of course are death. And the next lesson that came up was insufficient and that is that we're insufficient in ourselves. So there's no way that we can pay the price for our sin. Uh, we don't have the power to uh, uh, be able to uh, forgive our own sins and we can't keep the law perfectly therefore we're insufficient the only sufficiency is in Christ we're justified that was our next lesson we're justified by faith not by works uh, faith in Jesus Christ who died for our sins and we were justified by his work on the cross and then we came to the lesson on uh, at peace and the only way that we can find a real peace is by trusting in him. And that's particularly true today as we look at the virus and other things that are going on in the world. Uh, we just got to believe that God is our sufficiency. He's on his throne and we can have a peace even in the midst of trouble. Matter of fact, I want you to, uh, when you get a chance, look up John 16, 33. It says, in the world you'll have trouble or tribulation. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world and uh, Jesus wants us to have that peace knowing that he's in charge. The next lesson that came up was free and that is that we're free from the guilt of sin. Uh, once we accept Jesus as Savior uh, and have asked his forgiveness of our sins, we can put it behind us and it's just as if we hadn't sinned. That's justification, just as if we hadn't sinned. And if you try to bring it back up to God and you've already asked his forgiveness, uh, he's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. He's already forgotten your sin, forgiven your sin as well. And then we had uh, uh, the, the lesson on raised and uh, the proof of Christ's power and the proof of Christ's deity is the fact that he was raised from the dead, just as he said he would be, just as the prophets had prophesied he would. And we have the proof that we need that he was raised. And then came the lesson on secured. Uh, we have secured eternity. 
uh, we're going to spend an eternity in one of two places. That is not our physical bodies, but our spiritual bodies. Uh, our, and, and that's going to be in an eternity in heaven rather than an eternity in hell. And then came saved. We're saved by faith and not works. And the next lesson was on mercy. Uh, it's not that we deserve it. It's not that we're pretty good guys. And uh, God put us on a balance of scale and said, okay, I guess you're better than most. So, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and let you into heaven. No, mercy is unmerited favor. and We don't deserve it, but we get it through him. And it's true for both the Jew and the Gentile. We both get that mercy. Sacrifice. Uh, it was the next lesson up, and we should be living a living sacrifice. That is, our uh, gratitude and our appreciation for God's mercy and grace ought to be one of a desire to uh, serve Him and to sacrificially serve Him and to live out uh, all that He's commanded us to do. Then came our list, uh, lesson on citizens. Uh, we're citizens of this world and God has called us through his word uh, to be in obedience to the governments around us and to recognize that the only time we're to oppose government is when they're in contradiction with the scripture's teaching and uh, then it's permissible to go against the government but uh, otherwise we should be in obedience because God allowed them uh, to be in power we got to accept that in his permissive will, even if it's bad government, that God allowed it. And then accepting, we're to accept one another, uh, the people, uh, Jew or Gentile, perfect or imperfect, <laughs> uh, brand new baby Christians or uh, well-seasoned and well-trained Christians, we're to accept them. Now, that doesn't mean we accept sin. Uh, there's a very good line there that we need to remember. We accept the person in their imperfections, but we don't accept sin. Uh, and so there's a balancing act there that we have to find that acceptance for the person without accepting sin. And then uh, today we're going to be talking about reaching uh, a, a cooperative advancing of the kingdom of God and advancing of the mission, uh, which Paul clearly talked to. Uh, and there's two words that I want us to uh, define today. I, I think I've always been a little bit hesitant to deal with these two words because I was a little bit reluctant to define them. The first word is exhortation. That is to urge or to advise, to encourage. Uh, it's the goal of worship. It's the application or instruction of the scriptures second word is admonish. Uh, and you, you might say, well, you know, if you look in the Webster's Dictionary and other places, it seems to have kind of the same uh, definition uh, of advice or instruction or encouragement. Uh, but actually admonishing is instruction from Scripture. And that uh, it means to warn uh, using scripture to warn someone of the consequences uh, of, of something and uh, to be able to instruct them through a warning of the heaven or hell or whatever the subject might be. So uh, exhortation and admonishing, very similar in nature, except one is uh, an encouragement of instruction and a goal of worship and application of scripture to things while admonishing is to kind of warn uh, very often a parallel of uh, these are the two consequences of, of an action uh, would be an admonishment. And we're going to be looking at that today as we look at Romans chapter 15. So let's, uh, let's take another look uh, at Romans 15. It would be foolish for us to look at chapter 15 and not put it in context. And so let's take a look at uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7 first, which is not really in the text of today's lesson. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we need to keep it in context. And so uh, in verses 1 through 7, Paul is talking about not having a selfishness. Uh, that is, uh, 
not to live to please ourselves, but to live to please God. Now, let me say that again because that sounds like a simple principle, but it's not. Uh, our natural nature is selfishness. Uh, if you don't believe that, go down to the nursery when the nursery is back in action and watch children. Uh, if there's one toy uh, between two children, they both want it. Uh, our natural nature is a selfish nature. And here Paul is exhorting us and uh, he's telling us to uh, try to please God, to live to please Him. Uh, and if we did every activity of life saying, would this please Him? Uh, we, we would go a long way to having a much better and healthier life. Uh, because uh, if we were to look at seconds on the Danish rolls and uh, some of the things that are not the best for us when we overindulge, and we said, now what would please God for me to have two more Danish or to uh, just uh, be satisfied with the one? And so we, we recognize that uh, not being selfish and not being desirous of filling, fulfilling our own flesh, uh, but to live out for God and to say every activity we did in life uh, was to please Him, that would be a good thing. Now here's three things that he's listed in uh, chapter 15 that we ought to try to do to please Him. The first one is to respect other believers. Notice I said believers we should work towards the best that we can respecting other believers. The second thing that we should do is we should rejoice with other believers. You see, when somebody posts on Facebook uh, that they led somebody to Christ, and but they from another church, maybe even what we consider a competing church because they're in the same community with us, we still ought to rejoice with them when somebody is saved or when they're growing and teaching the Word of God, we, we ought to rejoice with other believers. Uh, I, I rejoice with Five Forks Baptist Church. I rejoice with Landrum Baptist Church. I rejoice with Beulah Baptist Church with Midway. Uh, I rejoice with, with all of the churches that are preaching the Word of God, and we ought to. God says if we want to be pleasing to Him, we need to respect other believers, but we also need to rejoice with other believers. And the third thing He says is we need to receive other believers. Now, they may have doctrinal differences with us. As long as they believe in Jesus Christ, is Son of God and is God and died for our sins, we have the salvation foundation that we can all agree upon and that we know will get us to heaven. Uh, we may not believe the same way about uh, the book of Revelation and end times. We may not believe the same thing about uh, method of baptism or how often we ought to have communion. Uh, but, but we ought to be able to receive the other believers uh, as believers. And if we want to please God, we ought to respect other believers. We ought to rejoice with other believers. And we ought to receive other believers even if they have some minor uh, discrepancies from the exact way that we believe. And Christ is our example of that. <laughs> uh, Christ absolutely practiced that when he was here on earth and set an example for us to show us. And he said one of the things that we can do as we work through all of that is to exhort and admonish. We use the scriptures to exhort and to admonish. And that that's good for all believers to be able to go back to God's Word and exhort and admonish. Uh, that's not a judgmental uh, admonishing. That's not a judgmental exhortation. Uh, but that's rather uh, taking the Scriptures and allowing the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit to do the work. And so if we looked at verses 5 through 7 in chapter 15, we would find that uh, God is pleased when we have unity and acceptance. Let me say it again for you. God is pleased when we have unity and acceptance. Uh, and that goes so far to build a church. It really does. And to have good fellowship in a church. Uh, and so often we look so closely at other believers and make judgments and uh, they're not just like we are. They're not from the same social circle that we're from. They're not from the same economic social uh, circuit that we're from. Uh, they're different in some other ways. Uh, 
and, and uh, therefore we want to shut them down or we want to argue with them and, and uh, that's not what God wants God wants us when we exhort and when we ad admonish to do it for the purpose of building up the kingdom of God in love and care and concern and openness and Paul certainly says in chapter 15 that he did that boldly with many Christians along the way uh, always in love always for the purpose of building up the kingdom of God and so that's what we find in verses 1 through 7 and Paul goes on in verses 8 through 13 and he talks about the ministry of Christ in our ministry uh, that is that we need to be sure that we understand the distinctive promises that God made to the Jews through the Old Testament prophets and from the very beginning of time uh, God promised the Jews uh, that they would see a Messiah and that they would be delivered uh, and that doesn't leave out uh, the Gentiles because clearly the Jesus teaching in the New Testament uh, defines the fact that this grace, this mercy, this kindness would be extended to the Gentiles. So it was promised to the Jews, it was extended to the Gentiles, and, and it's like those trees on the branches we talked about. Uh, if they're grafted in, if they're believers on the tree, they never come off. If they're not believers, uh, they come off. If they're on the tree and they're both believers, they can be pruned but never removed. Uh, and that pruning is only for the purpose of advancing the kingdom uh, So and being more fruitful. So we need to remember those things uh, very clearly as, as we continue our study. We need to be sure we understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for Jew and Gentile and he wants us to be sure to understand that and not judge people on the minors uh, and even if we disagree on some of the majors we can do it agreeably uh, and we don't have to approve sin uh, but again through the scriptures admonishing and exhorting uh, we use the scriptures to bring about the truth but again not judging and not condemning because of minor disagreements uh, and so we have those first uh, 13 verses for us as a backdrop. We need to be sure that uh, we know that uh, Gentiles are saved and that uh, even though the customs and practices of the Jews was different than the Gentiles, uh, that that uh, was clearly approved of Jesus, that they didn't have to uh, be circumcised, that they didn't have to follow certain dietary rules, and that they didn't have to follow uh, those uh, regulations that had been set and embellished beyond what God had commanded. But that was both for the Jew and the Gentile. Neither one had to continue those things. Uh, it wasn't just that the Gentiles didn't have to. But you can understand that the Jews uh, who had been practicing those things and who had been commanded uh, some of those things, not, not the embellishments of, of man, but the original rules and regulations that God set down, couldn't understand why the Gentiles uh, could have salvation without following uh, some of these basic uh, Jewish practices. And so that's uh, kind of the backdrop. And what uh, Paul does masterfully is he, he goes back to the Old Testament and he shows the promises to the Jews about salvation and grace and mercy and the coming Messiah and that uh, that that would be extended to the Gentiles even in the Old Testament it's talked about about being extended to the Gentiles and we'll discuss some of the scriptures that you can look at there's Psalm 18 Deuteronomy 22 and Psalm um, Psalm number 117. These are all scriptures that talk about the fact that uh, the Gentiles would also receive uh, the blessings of God. And that brings about joy and peace and hope. <laughs> Aren't you glad that we have joy, peace, and hope? And a lot of um, backdrop for today's lesson, which we're going to start uh, 
looking at the verses that are in today's lesson. We're starting with verse 14 of chapter 15. So here's verse 14 of 15. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Now remember that Paul was not one that had started the church at Rome, and he recognizes that. But he also is using both of those words that we talked about. Uh, he's exhorting them, that is, he's encouraging them by saying that he has great confidence in them because he understands that they have the discipline and the drive and the determination that they can also admonish one another with sound doctrine. And so he's a great encourager and he sees that uh, they have a good foundation, a solid foundation for encouraging, for admonishing, for exhorting. Uh, it's all right there and he has confidence in this church and he's going to help build this church up by his encouragement. My friends, we never realize the value of encouragement. Uh, not only the, those that encourage us, that uh, encourage us on in the faith, but for us to give encouragement to others. I would really challenge you, uh, all of you that are watching this video, to encourage your teachers, encourage your pastor, encourage your staff. Uh, be an encourager. It's a wonderful ministry. And uh, if you have to from time to time, to exhort them, uh, to to come alongside of them, do it privately. <laughs> uh, do do your exhortation or your warnings uh, in a way that's in love, but private and not uh, public. Uh, there's no question as we look at chapter 16 of Romans, we, we know that uh, he tells the people to keep an eye on those that are stirring trouble and strife. And, and uh, we don't want to be those that cause strife and, and uh, division in the church. We want to be encouragers. And Paul is convinced that this church at Rome, that uh, he didn't start, but he has observed and watched their doctrine and watched their conduct. Uh, he's convinced that they're going to continue to grow because they have a solid base of doctrine and of teaching. Let's take a look at verses 15 and 16. But I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God to be ministers of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul has had to have been blunt about several of the issues about accepting the weak and uh, accepting those that don't follow all of the Jewish traditions and customs uh, because he wants to be sure that uh, the work that he's done amongst the Gentiles, the teaching and the doctrine that he's laid down in their lives uh, would be an acceptable offering to God. Uh, you see, Paul's only interest was to glorify God. And he wanted to be sure that those that were in Rome, uh, particularly of the Hebrew faith, uh, understood that he had had to have been pretty blunt with them. Uh, and his exhortation, if you will, uh, with the fact that he wanted to admonish them to accept the Gentiles and to understand that they're an offering to God, one that was promised long ago uh, that the good news would be extended not only to the Gen to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And here he's reminding them uh, of that promise that God had made, and that that's why he's had to be so blunt with them about accepting the Gentiles and not following everything that the Jews follow. I want you to notice in the next five verses uh, how many times words like therefore or thus, or because of, uh, or the term uh, that would indicate that we need to consider what's already been said. 
it's, it's amazing how many times Paul builds upon what's already been said in the next five verses. So let's begin with verses 17 through 19. Uh, and uh, be sure to watch for those words that refer you back to what's already been said. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in the things pertaining to God. Therefore, remember verse 17, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed in the power of the signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem around about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. If you're not careful here, you may believe, believe that Paul has been boasting about himself. But look again at those verses and see that Paul clearly says what Christ has done through him uh, for the glory of God. And he notice Notice also that he's talking about his ministry to the Gentiles and the wide travels that Paul has taken. Uh, Illyricum may be a strange name to you because you remember Ephesus and Philippi and all of those other places where Paul has been, but you don't recognize Illyricum. And uh, that's because it's a region. Uh, and uh, the map that I'm about to show you will help you to see uh, not only where Illyricum is, uh, but also it will help you to understand the wide area that Paul has preached the gospel to the Gentiles. So let's take a look at that map. Top left-hand corner is Illyricum, and the bottom right-hand corner is Jerusalem. Uh, that's about a 500 by 500 area, 500 miles by 500 miles. So that's 250,000 square miles. Uh, that Paul has covered. Look at all of the cities that he's covered and ministered to the Gentiles. No wonder he's concerned about them being an, a sacrifice and an offering to God. Uh, he's invested his life in travel and visiting these. Some have said that Paul traveled over 10,000 miles uh, in his travel and ministering to the Gentiles. So remember that Paul has uh, not traveled by automobile or airplane, uh, but uh, by sailing ship and by foot, and perhaps sometimes by horseback. But uh, he has covered an incredible area of ministering to the Gentiles and invested his life in bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, as was prophesied by the Old Testament. And uh, he certainly is concerned uh, that they not be discouraged by uh, people nitpicking the fact that they are not following all of the customs and traditions of the Jew. Now let's look at verses 20 and 21. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul was going to be truly an evangelist. Uh, he wasn't going to go and strengthen believers that had already been established. Uh, his ministry was to create new churches and to create new believers in Christ. And that was his mission. That was clearly what the Holy Spirit was leading him to do. Uh, it's quite interesting because it's kind of the reverse uh, of what the local church does. The local church does build upon uh, the ministers that were before me at Southside Baptist Church. Uh, I built upon their ministry, and the ones that have followed me have been building on my ministry. And, and that's a little different. However, I want you to understand that where Paul is going with this whole dissertation is a challenge to build on those believers, but also to reach new believers. Uh, the quotation that he takes from the Old Testament here uh, is very important. There are lots of people that have not seen or heard the Word of God and that they need to hear it. And we need to be sure that we're missionaries as well as encouragers and as well as builders in the local church. Uh, 
So let's not forget that as we look at verses 20 and 21. We need to be sure that we understand that the mission of the church is both to grow as uh, spiritually those that are there, the sheep that are there, and to feed them and encourage them, but it's also to reach the lost. And I think sometimes we get just a little too comfortable uh, encouraging the current Christians without looking to see those that have not seen or heard and not accepted Christ as Savior. Friends, the time has to be short. The signs of the times are everywhere. God's coming again has to be soon. And we need to be about his business, not only encouraging and building up the believers in the church, but also reaching those that have not heard. Now let's look at uh, the final verses again. Uh, we skip over some verses from uh, verse 22 through 29. We see Paul's talking about going to Rome. He talks about the fact that he asked them to pray for his safety uh, as he's bringing this offering uh, from uh, the, the north to Jerusalem for the poor saints there. Uh, but he's looking forward to uh, fellowshipping with those in Rome. But much more than that, he continues to talk about Spain. Uh, that's an area he hasn't been yet. It's an area where the gospel perhaps is not yet reached. Uh, or if it has, it's just beginning. And so he's excited about his next missionary journey. Uh, we sometimes think about Paul and the fact that he had three missionary journeys. But many believe he actually had four. Uh, missionary journeys. We just don't have any scriptural recording of the fourth missionary journey. Let's take a look then at verses 30 and 31. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. Paul wasn't afraid to ask for prayer, and we shouldn't be afraid to ask for prayer whenever we set out on a mission for God. Uh, it's Lois and my privilege to be able to pray for the VBS workers this year. Now, I don't know if VBS is going to be possible with all that's going on. Uh, I certainly hope that it can be safely conducted, but nevertheless, it's a privilege to be a prayer warrior for those that are serving in VBS. And I would hope that you would always consider that prayer for others that are in the ministry is a privilege and uh, that we should take that privilege with great honor, respect, and uh, that we should be faithful to that prayer. Uh, Paul certainly ap appealed for prayer and not only safety against those that uh, wanted to arrest him in Jerusalem and uh, perhaps kill him, but he also wanted to be sure that the offering that he was bringing was going to be acceptable and glorifying to God. Now, how do we apply all of this that we've studied today in our everyday life? Is it just a bunch of history or is there application for us? Well, I think it, there's a lot of application for us. First, I think there's a need for both exhortation and admonishing. Uh, we need to be sure that we always do both in love and for the purpose of glorifying God. But there's a place for encouraging and there's a place for admonishing and always in love, and always for the purpose of building up the saints. Secondly, I think Paul had an incredible ministry, but he recognized that in, in spite of all of the success that he had, it wasn't him. It was Christ working in and through him. We need to be careful of our pride, and when we think that we've accomplished great accomplishments, that we recognize that really is God working in and through us that brings about the accomplishments. Uh, we can do nothing on our own. The power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is the power that we use when we minister. We need to be sure we don't get puffed up with pride. Uh, we need to be sure that when we've had a successful ministry or a successful outing, uh, that we don't take the credit for it, but that we say, to God be the glory. And then finally, we need to be sure 
that we're uh, building not only on others' work in the church to help them to grow and to become more of what they ought to be, but that we also ought to be missionaries uh, for those that need to hear. And that doesn't mean we have to go to Africa. Uh, all we have to do is look across the street and we see people that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So it's very, very important that we recognize there is a building that needs to go on in the church, and that's building on another man's ministry. But there also is a mission for all of us in the places where we work, in our own families, uh, in our extended families, and the places across the street. There are people that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson in the book of Romans, and I hope that you're going to stay tuned for Mark's message uh, whether you're there in person or whether you watch it on video, I know he'll have a great message for us from God's Word, and I hope that you'll take and apply it to your life just as you apply today's Sunday School lesson. And so this is Pete Vandeway. I'm going to give you a brief clip of another place. Nobody guessed where I was last week with that uh, clip that I had in the background. So I'm going to give you another background this time, a different place. You try to guess where I am. Okay, it's time to play that game again. Where in the world am I? Well, I hope that you can take a look at the uh, couple of places that I'm going to be today and uh, send me an email and let me know if you know where I am. It's uh, always fun to play Where Are You in the World? So uh, these are places that I've been and I uh, hope that uh, you get a chance to go there too. But uh, I'm still looking to see if you can tell on last week's video if you tell where I was. Nobody guessed it. And uh, see today if you can tell where I am by the uh, two places that uh, I'm going to show you today. Uh, and I hope that you have a great day. God bless you.